Salam, Namaste, Adab, and welcome to today's event. Today's topic is the Shaheen Bagh movement. You know, Shaheen Bagh became a real story in India last year, uh, and it really changed the landscape, at least the mass movement that took place uh, by uh, lower middle class and middle class Muslim women, mostly in Delhi, uh, has a lot uh, really changed the political si situation in India. Uh, and Modi had to withdraw uh, those three or two um, laws that they were trying to put on. So Professor Vinay Lal is going to talk on the Shaheen Bagh movement and Indian Muslim women's revolt and the future of Satyagraha. Um, he will be formally introduced by Professor Shankar Swam, uh, Ramaswamy, who is the professor and executive director at the Center for Justice. And uh, Ra uh, Rafat, you took off or uh, took out the... Rafat? Again? You want me to put again? Yeah, I was uh, not... Okay, sorry. I didn't finish. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, sorry. Yeah, so Professor Ramasamy will be giving the formal introduction of Professor Vinay Lal. Uh, uh, professor Ramasamy is the Professor and Executive Director at the Center for Justice Studies at Jindal Global Law School, Sonipat, India. Uh, and the concluding remarks will be given by Professor Karnan Mantena, who is the Professor of Political Theory at Columbia University, New York. And Professor Vinay Lal is not new to us. He gave a mini talk here with Professor Devi. Uh, I know, you know, he's a, a professor at uh, UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles. So I'll now invite Professor Shankar uh, Ramaswamy for the introductory remarks. Uh, hello, Professor. Hello. Yes, so uh, welcome, friends. Vinay Lal is professor of history and Asian American studies at uh, UCLA. His many interests include the global politics of knowledge, South Asian history, the British Empire, world history, the South Asian diaspora, Indian cinema, genocide, authoritarianism, the Holocaust, nonviolent struggles, Gandhi, and the Black Freedom Movement. He has brought out about 20 books and a vast number of journal articles. These books include, most recently, Insurgency and the Artist, The Art of the Freedom Struggle in India, from Roly Books in 2022, and The Fury of COVID-19, The Passions, Histories, and Unrequited Love of the Coronavirus, from Pan Macmillan in 2020. Now, I should say that with Vinay, there are always more books in the publication pipeline. I know of at least five. More that are being written and even more that are being thought about and planned. And in Vinay's case, uh, when he's planning something, it actually gets realized. But I should say that there are quite a few book manuscripts that are complete or almost complete but are sitting on a shelf somewhere for whatever reason. Uh, I have seen a few of these as well. Vinay also has an active blog, Lal Salam, where he posts many of the pieces that he writes for the print media and online platforms. Now, I just want to briefly touch on or say something about Vinay's other qualities as a teacher and as a facilitator of other people's work. I don't mean just his formal teaching work at UCLA, his courses and his advising of graduate students. But some years ago, he built a website, Manas, on all kinds of topics to do with South Asia, history, politics, culture, diaspora, Gandhi, uh, which was of great benefit to many in and out of the academy. 
He also has a vibrant YouTube channel where he posts his lecture courses at UCLA. So anyone can access these classes. This is not a common practice I've found in the world of academics. Also on this channel, he speaks about important books, essays, and many other things, such as his thoughts on the occasion of January 30, Gandhi's uh, death anniversary. But there's more. I'm talking here about my own experiences. I've known Vinay for almost 30 years. I met him somewhat randomly in the library at the Center for the Study of Developing Societies in Delhi in the summer of 1993. I believe this was just before Vinay joined UCLA. And from that time, I kept in touch. He shared his writings. He gave suggestions on whom to take courses with when I went to graduate school. And I should say those suggestions were largely in philosophy, religion, and literature, not social sciences. And we met up occasionally in the US and in India, and later he would read my work and give me comments and criticisms, but never so as to ask one to conform to his way of looking at things intellectually or politically, no. And when he might ask for a contribution to a conference or an edited volume, I've seen that he gives you near complete freedom in choosing the topic, how long the piece will be, even what genre it will be. And this ethos extends all the way to final publication. This too, I feel is quite remarkable in the world of academics. So uh, for Vinay, hospitality, plurality, autonomy, these are not just ideals and purposes that seem to drive his own scholarly writing. Uh, they are values which he seeks to extend to others in his own life. So I'm grateful for this chance to introduce Professor Vinay Lal. Today, uh, Vinay will be speaking on the Shine Bag Movement, an Indian Muslim Women's Revolt, and the future of Satyagraha. So over to you, Vinay. Uh, uh, th thank you, Shankar, very much for your uh, uh, extremely generous uh, remarks. Um, my mind goes back, of course, to the days when we first met, and uh, I'm grateful for this three-decade friendship. Uh, uh, Razi, thank you very much for the invitation, um, and thank you, Karuna, also for uh, agreeing to uh, offer some concluding thoughts. So. Uh, uh, as you would have surmised from uh, uh, the introduction that Shankar gave, I have a wide range of interests. Uh, one of the consequences of that is that I'm really, unlike uh, uh, some others in the academy, I'm really a dilettante. And uh, I think you will find uh, some of the observations made in the spirit of someone who sort of looks at something for a while, it interests me, and then I sort of move on. So um, this particular sub, uh, the, this particular talk is at, uh, at the subject of a paper that has just been published uh, literally about two weeks ago in a journal called Protest. It's a relatively new journal. I'll be happy to share the published version of the article. If uh, anyone emails me, I'll be happy to send it to them. Um, and this talk, as has been mentioned, is on the Dadis, the grandmothers, I think the word dadis is more interesting than grandmothers, uh, the dadis of Shaheen Bagh and Indian Muslim women's protest and the future of Satyagraha. Um, what is the future of Satyagraha? What form might it take? <laughs> what, if anything, did Mohandas Gandhi have to say about Satyagraha? Uh, there have been a number of arguments that have been advanced over the uh, over the course of the last several decades. Some of these arguments go back to the time of Gandhi himself. And uh, there has been one argument uh, which has been along the lines that uh, Satyagraha against the British succeeded because the British were on the whole a rather gentlemanly lot. Uh, you know, that British colonialism in India compared to what uh, Stalin was doing in the Ukraine or what 
uh, uh, Hitler was doing uh, with the Nazis and so on. One could multiply these examples that uh, British colonialism was at the end of the, the at the end of the day a little bit like a Sunday picnic, uh, and that uh, had Gandhi's opponents been a totalitarian or authoritarian or severely authoritarian regime, uh, Gandhi would have been crushed instantly. Um, it is interesting, although that will not be the subject of my remarks today, that one of the uh, most successful uh, movements of resistance during the decade long period, a little bit more than a decade of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, the Nuremberg laws followed by, of course, the suppression of the Jewish people and their, and their attempted extermination, uh, that one of the most successful uh, movements was what is called the Rosenstrasse demonstration, uh, which was a demonstration that was carried out uh, strictly according to one might call the principles of nonviolence. Um, then there is a view of someone like uh, B.R. Ambedkar. Uh, now, uh, Ambedkar, in the, in the final speech that he gave uh, to the Constituent Assembly before the adoption of the Constitution of India, which, as we all know, came into effect uh, on 26 January 1950. So in his last speech in November 1949, this is what he said, and I quote, we must hold fast to constitutional methods of achieving our social and economic objectives. It means we must abandon the bloody methods of revolution. It means that we must abandon the method of civil disobedience, non-cooperation, and satyagraha. When there was no way left for constitutional methods for gaining economic and social objectives, there was a great deal of justification for unconstitutional methods. But where constitutional methods are open, there can be no justification for these unconstitutional methods. These methods are nothing but the grammar of anarchy, and the sooner they are abandoned, the better for us." End quote. Now, these remarks have sometimes been taken to um, mean that Ambedkar uh, who had reservations about Satyagraha and Gandhi's own lifetime, of course, that, that uh, uh, he uh, was of the view, this is what these remarks seem to suggest, that he was of the view that now that India was a sovereign republic, that there really was no place for such kinds of methods. But of course, others have interpreted it to mean that so long as there, there is a constitution and there is an avenue for constitutional methods, then in those circumstances, the resort to satyagraha would in fact be a form of anarchy. So it doesn't rule out the possibility of a movement, a nonviolent movement, uh, particularly if the intent of the nonviolent movement is to bring the country and bring the state in particular as the most egregious offender of the rights of a people, bring the state into conformity with the ambitions of the constitution, right? So it, it, I'm just suggesting that that's another view that one might have to really take into consideration. And there is a third view about uh, the question of the future of Satyagraha. And this view basically goes along the lines that given the kind of enhanced state power that even democracies have, so let's leave aside Let's leave aside totalitarian states, but but let's just take liberal democracies um, uh, uh, or other semi-liberal states. That given the enhanced uh, state power that we have, the increased use of sophisticated technologies of surveillance and governance, the alarming militarization that we see in in even democratic societies, that given all of that, nonviolent resistance becomes more difficult. Um, and of course, uh, my view on this matter is that such an objection is um, um, not really a very tenable objection because uh, it seems to me that uh, uh, observation of this kind is has in mind uh, the kind of political dissidence that one sees in China. So for example, if you think about the kind of regimes of surveillance uh, that the Chinese have launched for many years against the Muslims, 
um, in China, uh, where we know that face recognition technology, for example, has been widely used. Uh, I think that this observation is, uh, is an observation that speaks more to the conditions of a country such as China. Because I think we have to understand that uh, the reason this particular objection is not tenable is because one of the first principles of Satyagraha is that a Satyagraha works in the open. A Satyagraha has nothing to conceal. So the notion that, uh, uh, that uh, 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 enhanced regimes of surveillance and the use of such things as face recognition technology, that all of this might be a hindrance to Satyagraha as an argument that really, <clears throat> um, at least from the standpoint of the grammar of nonviolence, uh, really doesn't have any kind of uh, uh, purchasing power. Um, uh, Gandhi was certainly very clear that, uh, uh, that, that what distinguished, for example, uh, Satyagraha from the methods that were being used by some of his peers uh, in the Hindustan Socialist Republican Army, um, th that what distinguished uh, 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 the adherence of Satyagraha from, let's say, Bhagat Singh and his cohort was not simply the resort to violence, uh, even if we might say that it was a strategic use of violence by the HSRA, uh, but what really distinguished them was the fact that, that the idea of secrecy, the idea of doing things on the sly to keep your strategies a secret as it were, your next moves a secret from the state, all of this was in fact actually complete anathema to the idea of Satyagraha. Satyagraha, uh, if I may put it in the most ironic register, uh, it is in fact the total lack of surprise that distinguishes Satyagraha in some sense, right? So in thinking about Shaheen Bagh, my, my first set of considerations really had to do with how does, what does, what does the Shaheen Bagh movement, which of course I will get to in just a few moments, what does it really tell us about the future of Satyagraha? And of course, in order to understand that, we'll have to also take a look at the tenor of this uh, particular movement. Um, but let me turn once again to Gandhi for a few moments before I, uh, uh, before I move on to uh, the origins of the Satyagraha movement. Um, one might think that Mohandas Gandhi, who wrote voluminously on virtually everything, um, and as someone who was the architect of the idea of Satyagraha, one might think that he had a good deal to say about its future, about the future of nonviolent protests, whether in India or elsewhere. Um, uh, to the contrary, he has, in fact, very little to say about the future of Satyagraha. If you pour through uh, his writings, you, know, you don't find him really uh, saying very much about what he, uh, what he thinks might be the different forms that Satyagraha might take, how it might evolve, because uh, he certainly was of the view. Uh, uh, and this view is represented in his own uh, pronouncement that he moves from truth to truth. So often he was asked, that look, this is what you said uh, at some point in time, uh, and then 20 years later, you're saying something which is rather different. And, and his view there, very simply, um, uh, it, and this pronouncement has been actually added as a kind of a preface to many of the reprints uh, of his writings that have come out in booklets and short, uh, short books from uh, Navjeevan Press, was that uh, essentially I move from truth to truth, and I quote here from what he, mentioned on 29th April, 1933. I am not at all concerned with appearing to be consistent. In my search after truth, I have discarded many ideas and learned many new things. Old as I am in age, I have no feeling that has ceased to grow inwardly. What I am concerned with is my readiness to obey the call of truth, my God, from moment to moment. And therefore, when anybody finds any inconsistency between any two writings of mine, if he has still faith in my sanity, he would do well to choose the latter of the two on the same subject. Right? And it is for the same reason that we could say 
that in this, in this quest for truth as one without an end, it is therefore in this same spirit that we can realize why he would not offer what we might call a textbook definition of satyagraha. Uh, now, the Gandhi scholars might say, well, they actually tons of definitions of satyagraha. You look through his writings and every now and then he'll tell you what it is. It's soul force. Uh, it's uh, offering the truth to someone. Um, let's remember, let's recall that the word satya, uh, the, the root of this word is sat, which is being. So therefore, when an opponent is confronted with satyagraha, which that person is confronted with the truth of their own being, so to speak. There is no way fundamentally to resist something called satyagra, right? But uh, 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 none of these is what we might call a textbook definition. And one reason for that, as I've already suggested, is precisely because, as he says, he moves on from truth to truth and that uh, as the situation changed. Of course, there are some bedrock principles, uh, and these bedrock principles have been, uh, needless to say, the subject of much discussion, including, of course, the idea of satya, the idea of ahimsa, um, uh, and many other related terms, um, <clears throat> uh, cognate terms that together constitute what we might call the grammar uh, of satyagra. Um, but uh, in, uh, in giving this overview, let me offer a number of other suggestions, which I think are pertinent to the, to the present discussion, uh, which will lead to uh, Shaheen Bagh. There is nothing in his writings to suggest that he envisioned Satyagra as something that can only be carried out by a colonized people. And I say this with some emphasis because this speaks to the remark that B.R. Ambedkar, uh, uh, which I had cited, had offered when he suggested that now that India was a sovereign republic, there really was no need as such for extra constitutional methods. Uh, but in my view, there is nothing uh, uh, in the entire oeuvre of Gandhi's writings which suggest that Satyagra is something that can only be carried out by colonized people. In fact, uh, let us also recall that for Gandhi, Satyagra begins actually at home. Uh, you know, so there is a long history to be written here of how he observed uh, his own mother, uh, what his relations were with Kasturba, uh, and how, in fact, if you think about, let's say, for example, the practices of fasting, right? What is a relationship between fasting at home and what we might call taking the practice of fasting to the body politic? How do you insert the body into the body politic itself? Uh, if one keeps this in mind, I think it becomes all too apparent that he never really gave much thought to the political contingencies, whether you are in a totalitarian system or an authoritarian system or a monarchy, uh, some kind of absolutist state or even a democracy, none of this really, it seems to me, had any fundamental bearing to, uh, uh, on the question of the circumstances under which Satyagraha can be offered, nor was Gandhi willing to concede, and this goes back to the remarks I began with, nor is there anything to suggest that he was willing to concede that its efficaciousness could in any manner be hindered by the ruthlessness of the opponent. Indeed, if there is anything that Gandhi is insistent upon, it is the proposition that any limitations encountered in a Satyagra campaign, leaving aside one might say, of course, outright suppression by the state, reflect only the shortcomings of the practitioner. The idea of Satyagra is in his view, inherently flawless, and it is irresistible, if only because, as I've suggested, the opponent who is confronted with Satyagra is being confronted with the truth, the Satya, indeed, with their very being. So long as truth cannot be extinguished, satyagra cannot be extinguished. Now, let me move on then to the Shaheen Bagh movement. Um, uh, it is also, I think, uh, uh, if uh, uh, you know, if I had the luxury of being able to do this, uh, 
Um, I would have ventured to offer a more extended commentary on what is happening in Iran as well, uh, because uh, it seems to me that Shaheen Bagh may have presaged the extraordinary upheaval that has been quietly, for the most part, taking place in Iran, where once again, it is women, uh, most of them young enough to be the granddaughters of the Dadis uh, of Shaheen Bagh. Uh, 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 this movement that has been convulsing Iran uh, uh, it has been led by uh, very young women. And one could argue, of course, that they have shown the way to exercise nonviolent res res resistance to a regime that has shown no hesitation in the brutal repression of dissent. Shaheen Bagh is a largely Muslim enclave in North Delhi, in an area known as Jamia Nagar. This colony, um, we know that this is a word used widely in Indian English um, uh, to discuss certain areas. Um, uh, this colony uh, uh, or residential neighborhood was founded by one Sharik Ansarullah, who is now about 63, 64 years old, who in 1979 had come to study at the Jamia uh, Milia Islam one of the more renowned universities in India that is earmarked as a minority institution uh, where Muslims account for about two thirds of its student body. Uh, he and his family purchased 80 uh, bigas, that's about 26 and a half uh, acres of land in a village that they named Shaheen Bagh. Uh, Shaheen is a word of Persian origin meaning falcon and Ansarullah's kin seem to have been inspired by the celebrated poet Muhammad Iqbal, in whose poem, Sitaron Se Aage Jaha Or Bhi Hai, appears this verse, Tu Shaheen Hai, Parvaz Hai, Kaam Tera, Tere Saamne Asman Or Bhi Hai. So this would be, uh, you translate would be roughly, translation would be, you are a falcon, your task is to fly, and before you there is this whole white sky to soar high in. Now, though accounts of the precise beginning of the Shaheen Bagh movement remain sketchy, on the late evening of 15 December 2019, a few women from the neighborhood sat down in the middle of a major arterial road that connects the area to uh, the large metropolis, which of course is India's capital. Uh, earlier in the evening, the news channels had carried reports of an attack by the Delhi police on the students of Jamia who had been protesting the passage of the Citizenship Amendment Act, uh, which I will henceforth refer to as CAA, to which I will turn in the following section of my remarks. Uh, the news coverage appeared to suggest an unprovoked and sometimes brutal assault, some of it carried out on female students and some on students studying in the university library. Jamia, as I've noted before, is a reputed university in the vicinity of Shaheen Bagh, and some of the students were young enough to be the grandchildren of the neighborhood's grandmothers. The women, to use an Indian idiom, decided to sit dharna. Okay, uh, they decided to sit dharna, a practice documented in very early Indian texts. Now, uh, this is a, a complicated matter, which uh, I, I will only spend a very short time on, because whether uh, sitting dharna conforms to satyagraha uh, is a subject for much discussion. Uh, there hasn't been any discussion on it, uh, but uh, Gandhi himself, for example, uh, thought of sitting dharna as a form of duragraha rather than as satyagraha. Uh, uh, that is a form of falsehood, really, uh, the force of falsehood. Uh, but, but we can think of this as a form of sitting dharna, um, and the practice of sitting dharna has been documented, um, uh, I would say, uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, since at least uh, early medieval times in India. Uh, so there was a there was a quite an extraordinary article that appeared by uh, uh, what is now what now would be called an Orientalist scholar, uh, a man by the name of Hopkins, in the Journal of the American Oriental Society. I don't know about 125 years ago where he looks at the various instances of sitting dharna. Um, it has analogs with a practice that you found in, um, in uh, 
uh, in Ireland. Um, uh, this is what has led some scholars to speculate for the last hundred odd years, uh, even more than that, on uh, similarities between certain practices uh, in Ireland and India, particularly political practices. Uh, but uh, this practice of sitting dharna means that you sit in a place and you refuse to move. And when you, when you uh, refuse to move, you also thereby refuse to eat unless people bring the food to you. Uh, but you, uh, so in other words, fasting uh, is concomitant to the practice of sitting uh, dharna. Um, uh, and it has been, as I said, uh, one way of characterizing what they were doing was that they were actually just sitting. Um, it, it has been argued that this can be tantamount to committing suicide, although this was never a consideration here. Uh, uh, at all. Um, the, there is a very interesting history. I just mentioned this as an aside for some of those who are interested in these uh, scholarly practices and curiosities, uh, so to speak, uh, that this sitting practice of sitting dharna really originated in the situation where a person took a loan from someone um, and then when the period of paying back the loan had passed, had elapsed and the loan had not been paid, then the creditor would go to the home of the debtor and sit dharna, right? Uh, this is how the practice really uh, originates. Now, um, when these women sit down, there are a couple of women initially, and over the space of a few evenings, the, the gathering becomes larger and larger. Uh, I did visit uh, Shaheen Bag that same winter. So this was uh, later uh, uh, in, in December, so this was around 10 days after it started, and then once again, uh, some days after that. And uh, uh, eventually what one found was that the men folk joined the women as well, uh, with the difference that in the morning, the men rose and went to work, all right? Um, at first, as I said, it's a handful of women, uh, a trick, then a trickle, uh, then hundreds had joined, and eventually a shamiana, a large tent comes up. Uh, this is the kind of tent that is ordinarily used for public functions and weddings. Uh, it's pitched on the street and the site is transformed into a public assembly hall. Um, some people were beginning to demand uh, by around Christmas time that these women be removed. Uh, the supporters pointed out that because traffic was being blocked and all of that, and of course, from uh, the modern middle-class bourgeois point of view, when traffic gets blocked, well, that's the end of the world. Uh, you know, uh, so you know, this becomes the, the imperative. Let's just remove these women because it's, it's blocking the traffic. So in a, uh, the police, in a, a clumsy attempt, um, uh, you know, uh, to try to put an end to this, they tried to, they, they cordoned off the area um, and using the ham-fisted approach that the Delhi police often does, they try to prevent outsiders from joining the protest. But there is no question that by around Christmas time, it had become what some would call a spectacle. There were thousands that were thronging into the area, many to express their support, some doubtless out of curiosity, many prominent public figures started to make their way to the protest site, uh, and and op politicians belonging to the opposition parties started appearing as speakers. However, I should underscore the fact, notwithstanding the what I've just said about some politicians from the opposition parties showing up as well, I should underscore the fact that the Shaheen Bakh site never gave an appearance of having been hijacked by political opponents of the regime. I think that there is no question to my mind, and I say this not only from what I saw, but from the anecdotal accounts of many others. And now, of course, there are a number of books, uh, mainly journalistic accounts that have been published. There are several that have been published already uh, on the Shaheen Bakh movement. And all of this, I, I think, confirms the view that I have put forward here, that there is really nothing to suggest that this site had been hijacked by political opponents of the regime. Uh, quite to the contrary, the sheer presence of the women and their ability to command the public space with their fortitude remained for many spectators, including 
myself the most impressive part of the resistance. Um, now, um, I should also say that, you know, even though one uses a phrase, the dadis or grandmothers, uh, some of the women who joined were actually considerably younger. Uh, I cannot now here reveal the, the details of it, but there are 22 interviews that were conducted uh, by uh, um, a PhD student on behalf of me, as uh, all in Hindi, with some of the women who took part in it. Um, and uh, uh, these interviews uh, suggest very clearly that a large number of the women who took part in it were considerably younger. Uh, not all of them were actually homemakers, which is what had been suggested initially. Um, some of the women who took part in the protest, uh, apart from being college students, dreams, some of them were business women, um, uh, some, uh, even a few lawyers and a few doctors. Many came with children, some without. The women sat in rows facing the podium almost in disciplined formation. In the evening, some took their children home, fed them, and then returned to spend the night under the Shamiana. The women helped each other with household chores, taking care of each other's domestic responsibilities, visiting homes, babysitting, bringing children to the protest site. Often the children played on the podium, sometimes holding national flags, almost as if to preempt the criticism, which Hindu nationalists in and outside the government have deployed to deflect, defang, and delegitimize all dissent. All right. Um, as the protests gained momentum, the students showed remarkable ingenuity, the students who had lent their support to the movement. Um, for example, in one corner of the protest site, alongside the Shamiana, they set up a portable library with children's books, books for young adults, and art material, paper, colored pencils, Prions. This freed mothers partaking in the protest from having to bear, as is usually the case, sole responsibility for the care of children. Right? So, and, and this and, and this library is is uh, is interesting because remember that the, that one of the things that precipitated the movement was the attack on the Jamia Library, right, on the evening of December fifteenth, and it is later in that evening that these women actually went out and sat down for the first time. Um, but the idea of a library is also important because when we think about uh, the place of uh, self-education, uh, we think about how uh, uh, political accidents, many of whom are autodidacts, right? Uh, I think all of this is recalled when we think uh, about the use of a library here, and we have to think about someone like, let's say, Bhagat Singh, uh, reading in jail, right? Reading in jail. So there are certain practices of reading revolution, so to speak. And I think that some of these uh, are being summoned in a way. One could take a much more prosaic interpretation of this, of this library, but it appears to me that this is part of uh, the worldview that is being shaped here now at Shaheen Bagh. Now, there are more remarkable features that gave the Shaheen Bagh movement distinct features, which suggest how the women behind it had in their own inimitable fashion, pushed non-violence, non-violent resistance into new terrain, right? That's the library is one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is uh, what you might call the radical decentralization. Uh, this is something that, by the way, is to be seen, I think, in the, in the movement in Iran as well. Uh, it has become very difficult to pinpoint leaders. So when, in fact, the Shaheen Bagh movement uh, broke out uh, and, uh, you know, over the course of the weeks, as it came to the attention of the media, including the international media, uh, remember that one of the women who became the public face of this movement, uh, Bilkis Dadi, uh, she then became uh, Time Magazine's 100 um, um, uh, people of the year. Uh, she was in that list of the 100 most prominent people of the year, right? So when, when, they, uh, when the media was looking for people to interview, when they said, well, we want to know who the leader of the movement is, uh, the women would, each of them would in turn, turn to the other, turn, say, go to this woman, turn to this woman, right? So this radical decentralization 
uh, uh, the what we might in other phrases call the devolution of power uh, is I think one of the most interesting aspects uh, of this movement. And uh, I should suggest perhaps that this may be also one way to think about the future of Satyagraha that when we think about, let's say the American civil rights movement, uh, notwithstanding the fact of course that they were what we were called the masses who were involved, uh, I've looked very closely at the sit-in movements, the freedom rides. Nevertheless, I think many of you would agree with me that the movement is generally associated with a few people become the public face of the movement. Most eminently, of course, Martin Luther King, just as was the case in India, and as was the case with the Khudai Khidmatkars, where Bacha Khan becomes by far, by far the most public face of the figure. Now, this is not the case really with Shaheen Bhatt, nor is it the case with the movement that we are seeing um, in, in Iran. All right, now um, let me turn very briefly to the CAA, because of course, uh, the question that many of you must be thinking of is what well, they're protesting. So what are they protesting about? Uh, wh what, is an, uh, what is it that instigated these women to go out uh, into the streets? Uh, and I have to say that here, my reading uh, attempts to do what I think, um, let me put it this way, what Gandhi would have done. Namely, that uh, I, don't, I don't purport to say that, well, this is, uh, that the CAA is unjust prima facie. I think we have to look at it, right? We have to look at it because, I mean, recall what Gandhi did every time, uh, beginning with Champaran, going back to South Africa, actually. Right, uh, uh, someone comes to him with, with a complaint and the indigo uh, people working on the indigo plantations in Champaran or in Ahmedabad when there's a mill worker strike. So first thing he does is he says, let me investigate the matter. Let me really probe it. Uh, because I think one of the, one of the fundamental um, ideas behind Satyagraha is the truth is never entirely entirely on one side, right? Which is not to say that there are two sides. That's a different proposition. Uh, but uh, what exactly is the CAA and uh, what did it originate in? What it originated, of course, in is the Citizenship Amendment Bill. Uh, a bill has to pass before it becomes an act. And it was on 10th December, 2019. So recall that the Shaheen Bagh movement, the women first go out on 15 December. So five days before on 10th December, uh, the Lok Sabha passed the CAB, the Citizenship Amendment Bill. Uh, the Rajya Sabha passed it the following day. And the, following, the day following that, that is December 12, the president of India signed the CAA into law. Okay. Um, uh, uh, the concern prima facie uh, that many people have expressed, the critics, and I think that this was not the language used by the dissenters, by the protesters themselves. Uh, not many of them said that this is an attempt to turn India into a Hindu Rashtra, into a Hindu nation state. That might have been tacitly part of what they were, what they were uh, expressing concern about. But certainly from the point of view of commentators, this has been prima facie the principal consideration that what is behind all of this is an attempt to disenfranchise the Muslim, to make the Muslim into a second class citizen and to turn India into a Hindu um, nation state. And of course, uh, it just bears saying here uh, so that one understands the context under which this uh, transpired that uh, the BJP has an absolute majority um, and uh, does not need the support of any other party to push through uh, legislation. Um, uh, they did much, they did even better in the 2019 election than they did in the 2014 election. So what is it that the CAA does? What it addresses principally is a path to citizenship for certain illegal immigrants distinguished by their religion and country of origin, All right? And that is prima facie where one, one thinks to oneself that this violates, for example, Article 14 of the Constitution, 
Uh, it addresses principally, let me repeat, the path to citizenship for certain illegal immigrants distinguished by their religion and country of origin. And its origins lie in a web of laws first initiated in the colonial period, regulating the entry of foreigners into India. I will not go over uh, if there are any questions about this during the q and I'll be happy to take it up, but in the interest of time, I will not go into the history going back to the colonial period of the legislation, which sought to regulate the entry of foreigners um, into India. Uh, it is also, uh, uh, in passing, I will also say that this, uh, uh, and before I get to the precise terms of this legislation, all right, that this particular bill was actually first introduced in 2016, in 2016, um, on, uh, in, in, on July 19th. Uh, it was referred to a parliamentary committee which submitted its report on 7th of January, 2019. And the Lok Sabha actually passed the bill on January 8th of 2019. So 11 months before, but it was then withdrawn because of the Assam question, um, where the question of the illegal migrant has resonated for many decades now, okay? For many decades. <clears throat> and, and then, of course, after the BJP won the election, the general election, uh, and gained even a larger majority, they felt emboldened to bring it back uh, uh, in December 9, 2019. And so confident they were that they would be able to pass it, uh, given how important this piece of legislation, it's astonishing that the, that the prime minister did not himself show up for the debate. Uh, this uh, it was shepherded by Amit Shah, the Home Minister, uh, and there was a ten-hour debate, and then it became law. All right. So, what does uh, in what does in concrete terms uh, 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 what does this uh, piece of legislation say? What it basically says is the following. Okay, um, at uh, people who have come. Um, uh, 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 non-Muslims who have come, religious minorities, people from religious minorities who came into India, okay, illegally, or who came legally, but then overstayed their visa, so that thereby they become illegal, who came before December 2014 from the neighboring states of Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Bangladesh, okay? These are the three states, religious minorities. And these religious minorities are enumerated and they include Hindus, Buddhists, Jains, Parsis, Sikhs, Christians, that they will be entitled to fast track citizenship. That's effectively what it says, okay? Um, and of course, um, uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Bangladesh, uh, so that we can understand what is the logic that informs this piece of legislation, right? Uh, the, the logic that informs it is that these three countries are predominantly Muslim countries. And that, of course, it is religious minorities who are in need of protection, who are in need of protection. Um, I might also say, although I did not mention this in my article, which I published, um, uh, and surprisingly, very few people have ever really referred to this, that there is similar legislation in the United States. Uh, okay, there is similar legislation in the United States. There is what is called the Lautenberg and Specter Amendment, uh, which was passed uh, three decades ago. Uh, it has been renewed every year by the US Congress, every year by the US Congress. And this piece of legislation was passed in order to enable uh, religious minorities in Iran, uh, okay? Uh, which meant fundamentally Christians and Jews uh, in Iran and the former Soviet Union, okay? Uh, uh, it, it gives these religious minorities fast track citizenship in the United States. That's what it does. It's the Lautenberg Inspector Amendment, um, but I just want you to bear, bear that uh, in mind, all right? 
Now, uh, uh, so there were a number of objections uh, that were raised to this. Uh, one is that, of course, in identifying people specifically by religion, uh, that this violates the spirit and letter of Article 14 of the Indian Constitution, which states that, quote, the state shall not deny to any person equality before the law or the equal protection of the laws within the territory of India, right? Uh, and Article 15 of, of the Constitution, of course, prohibits discrimination against any citizen on grounds of religion, caste, sex, and so on. Um, and of course, the kinds of objections that were made were, so I'm just gonna summarize this very quickly so I can move to my concluding remarks here. Uh, the objections that were made were that, well, what about the Shias, for example, that we know that there has been sectarian violence in Pakistan, um, uh, for example. In, in fact, I would say that the bulk of the people who have been killed in religious violence uh, are actually Shias in Pakistan, uh, certainly not Hindus. Uh, and if Shias are a religious minority, then why are they being excluded, for example, okay? Uh, and of course, uh, the state would say that, well, for one thing, uh, this is a dispute within the house of Islam, okay? Uh, you know, whether Shias are viewed as a Muslim religious minority, that is a matter to be adjudicated within the house of Islam. They're certainly not a minority insofar as they're Muslims. Uh, of, uh, 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 and uh, of course, a similar argument could be made apropos of the Ahmadiyyas. Uh, the, the other thing that we should take note of is the CAA does not say that religious minorities, i.e. the Hindus, Sikhs, Christians, etc., let's say from Kenya or Tanzania or Nigeria, that if they had come to India before 2014, that they would be entitled to fast track citizenship. It's not saying that. So it's not giving a, a blank check to, to Hindus from wherever or Sikhs from coming from wherever, not doing that at all. It's simply identifying three countries, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Afghanistan, which are predominantly uh, Muslim countries, all right? Um, so one one could one could continue in this vein to try to see what is the justification for the state, and of course I think one has to make a distinction where one might say that, well, yeah, look, one understands this, one understands the animus that guides the state, given everything else that has transpired in India, right? I I think that this is the view that that tacitly informs the view of all the commentators who are opposed to it, that look, whatever the logic might be that one might be able to show uh, that there are pieces of legislation of this kind, for example, that have been passed in other countries, one might say that, well, it doesn't give a blank check to, to Hindus everywhere and, and Sikhs and so on everywhere. It is only in these three countries where the argument would be, the the religious minorities, particularly Hindus, are clearly endangered. And then one would obviously have to look at the empirical evidence. And so I have a whole section in this paper which looks at some of the data. Uh, certainly, if you take the take the case of Afghanistan, there is but no question uh, that the Hindu and the Sikh communities have been virtually eviscerated. Uh, I mean, by uh, by most estimates, there are about 500, 500. Uh, Hindus and Sikhs left in Afghanistan today. Uh, the community was as large as about 200,000, about 1950, 200,000 to 400,000. Uh, so there's been an outward migration. Uh, we know, of course, what the history of Afghanistan has been over the course of the last uh, four decades. Uh, but by the same token, um, one has to say that it would be very difficult to argue that the Hindu population in Pakistan has diminished. Uh, this is a point constantly made uh, by the BJP. Uh, there is absolutely nothing to suggest that. The percentage is very low, but it has not decreased. In fact, if anything, it has marginally increased, actually, according to the demographic data that we have. Okay, And there are many ways to twist 
the statistics. Uh, we all know that, but I'm just laying it out so that one understands what are some of these um, considerations. All right. Um, and once again, I'll be happy to take this up. Uh, there are a number of other related considerations. Once again, I put them out. Uh, one of the, I think, things that animates, I think, the Hindus, um, the BJP, I would say, and of course, its various supporters and acolytes and so on, uh, is what in the U.S. is called the, re the, the replacement thesis. Uh, th there seems to be absolutely no grounds to think along those lines in India whatsoever but it, it has certainly come to the fore. And lastly, in this vein, before I, what it, what it means to think about belonging to a nation, um, I'll take about eight, 10 minutes to do that. And that will be my concluding set of remarks. Uh, the last consideration in this vein um, really is this. Uh, uh, and how much salience one wants to give to it, uh, and one's own thinking and discussion, I think is, I'll leave it to you. Namely that I have seen increasingly in many discussions uh, uh, in the Hindutva circles uh, and the writings of Hindu ideologues, and more generally, more widely in the writings of their Hindu middle-class sympathizers. You look at the magazine Swarajya, for example, I think is a good indicator of that. I have seen this uh, feeling being, um, Aired, that look, I mean, uh, the only home that the Hindu can call his own is India. Uh, there's Nepal, of course, but Nepal is part of that Indic worldview, right? So, uh, uh, but that India is principally the only home. Uh, the Muslim has 40 Muslim majority states that he can go to, that he or she can go to, right? Uh, and I think that uh, this uh, feeling, I think, has become increasingly important in the Hindu sensibility, that this is our only home and this home itself is no longer a secure home. Uh, of course, the latter part of it is completely bogus, uh, but th the point is that this feeling persists. Uh, whether, it, whether it requires to be addressed or not, uh, that is a question that I think uh, is in some ways an open question. That is, how does one actually meet that particular challenge? Now, uh, to think about what it belongs to a nation and what is a politics of citizenship, one would also have to look, which uh, I'm not going to attempt to do right now, one would also have to look at something called the, uh, the NPR, that's the National Population Register, and the uh, NRC, the National Register of Citizens. Uh, for those of you who have seen photographs of the of the movement uh, of the demonstrations, if you've seen videos, you would have seen many of the placards said "No CAA, No NPR, No NRC." The three were usually lumped together, and they're usually taken together. Uh, uh, the national, uh, the NPR uh, exercise. There is a clear misunderstanding about that, uh, even among the protesters. Although, let me hasten to add. Once again, that simply because there's a misunderstanding, even among the protesters and commentators, uh, that is no reason to in any way diminish the importance of the protest. I don't think protesters are duty bound to know everything, okay? And they are certainly not morally obligated to conform. I, I cannot stress this enough. They are not morally obligated to conform to someone else's notion of what is, quote, a genuine protest. When a movement takes place, people join in the movement for all kinds of reasons. And I think that that is in the nature of a movement. It is not an occasion really to be critical of the movement. Um, many years ago, there was a huge immigrant rights demonstration that took place in Los Angeles where, where I live. It's really large. I mean, I would say there were half a million people out there. I, I marched with that. When you look at the placards that people were carrying, some people were there because they were advocates for housing rights. Of course, housing rights and immigration rights often have a relationship, not necessarily a relationship, but often there is one. Some were advocates for LGBT rights, right? 
Uh, so people will come into a movement for all kinds of things. And this certainly happened with Shaheen Bagh as well. But as I said, that is no reason whatsoever to minimize the movement. And what I'm attempting to do here is, again, as I've done in my discussion of the CA, is to, is to sort of anticipate the criticisms and say, well, this is how one must think of it. These are some of the complexities that one must really think of. All right. So the NPR, the National Population Register exercise, was actually uh, conceived long before the Shaheen Bagh movement. Uh, and it wasn't designed simply by the BJP. It has a longer history. It was carried out in 2010 for the first time. All right. Um, whether the NPR could now be used, the National Population Register, uh, as a base to weed out non-citizens and from there derive the National Register of Citizens, that is a reason why this exercise is important, why the three have been clubbed together. But the NRC, that is the National Register of Citizens, right? it does not logically necessarily follow the NPR exercise. I, I just point that out. So the NPR was an exercise which was intended to actually um, uh, uh, determine uh, the, uh, of course, there's, there's something called um, the, the, the census, uh, which is what gives you the most reliable uh, demographic data. But what the NPR was intended to do was to look, in fact, at certain areas of the country uh, and then determine what kind of services were important for these areas. The, the, the view was that you could only do it if you had a much better idea. The, this uh, of uh, different areas and the population distribution. Uh, and this is what the NPR was really intended to do. Okay. Um, now, having said this, uh, let us look at the final set of considerations. So uh, 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 one, of the, one of the things that the women um, um, uh, uh, you know, involved in the movement, uh, they, the refrain that, that they constantly aired, uh, also aired by many others in the movement, hum kagas nahi dikhayenge. Hum kagas nahi dikhayenge. We will not show papers. That is that we will not show identity papers, okay? Because of course, the notion was that, well, how does a Muslim actually establish that he or she is in fact a resident of India? All right. Um, and there again, I have a long discussion. I, I'm simply alerting you, for example, birth certificates. Well, you'll be astonished to know uh, that in large parts of India, birth certificates are still not being issued. Okay. I mean, there's actually very reliable data uh, and uh, it, there is something called the National Family Health Survey. So they had round three of it, and then they had round four of it. And this, this National, National Family Health Survey, 2005-6, let me just quote from here. The births of less than one-fourth of children who belong to households in the lowest wealth quintile have been registered and only one in 10 have a birth certificate, okay? And the lowest, in the households with the lowest wealth, okay? Only one in 10. And Muslims among all these have the lowest rate among families that have birth certificates, even today. Right? This is according to the National Family Health Survey, uh, both round three and round four. Now, so when Muslim women and their supporters said, Ham kagas nahi uh, you know, th this is directly a reference to this. Of course, uh, one, can, one can read it in many other registers. One can read it in the register of um, uh, what is a piece of paper? Why is it that someone needs to be able to establish their identity if they have been grounded in the soil or the country for decades, for generations, right? And this is where the question comes, of course. Uh, what does it mean to belong to a nation 
and at one at what point does one cease being a foreigner and i think that this is of course in some ways a gist of the question this is one way in which you relate the shaheen bagh movement to wider questions such as for example something that we have all read about uh, which has been happening for a period of time but it's been widely reported particularly in the last two three weeks when when all of us read that uh, Muslims had been suddenly removed from textbook pages, that large portions of Indian history having to do with the history of Islam in India had simply been deleted from history textbooks, right? As Saeed Nakvi wrote a play very recently, the play is called The Muslim Vanishes, right? It's a very interesting play, extremely interesting play, uh, The Muslim Vanishes. So the Shaheen Bagh movement is partially a movement about how to think about the Muslim vanishing. This is what the NCRT textbooks are doing, right? The Muslim vanishes. And, and this, is where, this is where then again, I think that we are emboldened, we are enjoined rather to ask, what does it mean to think of being a foreigner? And is it the case that we really have become foreigners to ourselves? And so I think that let's say let's let's return for a moment to Gandhi. Um, uh, uh, there there is a wider question, which again maybe in the Q and A in the short Q and A that might comes up, the whole question of how Hindu identity itself has been forged. Uh, uh, you, you have to what extent it. were Sorry, everyone else to... required in order to forge something that we might describe as the corporate aggregate identity known as uh, the Hindu. But I think that uh, what, to my mind, is more most prominent uh, in this movement, uh, to sum up now, is the following. Number one, uh, it enables us to think about what is the relationship uh, of women, in particular, to the future of Satyagraha. The, where does the power of nonviolent resistance lie? Uh, is it the case? as Gandhi himself was of the view, Gandhi himself was of the view that in fact women, and, I, and there's a lot of critiques of that. There are the critiques about essentializing women, the essence of women and all of that. But uh, he himself was of the view that women are perfect satyagrahis or certainly can be better satyagrahis than men can be. Uh, and of course, we would have to look at the whole uh, panoply of uh, activities whereby Gandhi sought to, in some ways, one, what one might call feminize uh, the language of politics, right? Uh, he himself speaks about reducing himself to zero, becoming a woman, so to speak, right? So you have to wrap yeah. it up, wrap, yeah. wrap yeah. it up, okay. Right. Yeah. Right. So that, I think that that is part of the fabric of questions. And then there is a question of, um, and that would include such aspects which I've already sort of hinted at this whole issue of decentralizing uh, the movement uh, that this is, uh, that Shaheen Bagh suggests that this is perhaps the direction in which it might go. But I think what is also to my mind uh, critically important is uh, the question of uh, how it is that in India, the Hindus in particular have become foreigners to themselves. And so therefore, uh, in Gandhian terms, it would mean that, or as Tagore might have said, it means that they have forgotten what their own dharma is, right? And it is on this note, I will then just conclude. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was really very engaging and very, uh, very inform you know, informative. So let's uh, have the concluding remark by Professor. Maintainer, hello. Yeah, please. Yes. Um, thank you. I'll try to be short and to the point so we have some time for questions and answers. So thank you, Vinay. That was a very um, expansive and provocative paper. My um, my internet went out a little bit, so I missed some of the last remarks. So I'm going to keep my um, comments just to a couple of uh, questions and points you made at the beginning about Satyagraha. You started with this uh, very famous, but uh, also maybe to many slightly obscure 
remark that Ambedkar makes at the um, at the Constituent Assembly debates about a uh, worry about um, Satyagraha and the legacy of Satyagraha from the independence movement in its translation to post independent society, a newly established democratic constitutional state, a worry that the, the legacy was going to be one of anarchy or disrespect for law. Um, it's interesting that something very similar happens in the US post um, the civil rights movement in, in 68 because of partially the civil rights movement as well as the anti-war movements. The Kerner Commission in the early 70s also raises these doubts that the legacy of civil disobedience is one of anarchy. And I think uh, one of the things that that raises to me uh, to think about the future of Satyagraha, the past and future, is that partially, I think Gandhi himself tried, often failed, um, to make a very sharp distinction, um, or at least uh, Gandhi was very aware that Satyagraha had the capacity to be coercive um, or intimidating or violent in a less in the kind of traditional sense of uh, physically violent, but there is a kind of coercion that comes from um, fasting, can come from physical intimidation. And I think that he tried, often failed, to make those distinctions, the difference between a, a satyagraha fast versus another kind of fast. But those distinctions were often lost, both, uh, especially in India, and not just Ambedkar, but Nehru would con be concerned in the 70s about the legacy of satyagraha or extra constitutional protests or extra institutional protests in India becoming a force of um, intimidation or co another kind of coercion or mob activity. Um, so I wanna just go back to just thinking about uh, Shaheen Bagh and how it actually demonstrates the importance that Gandhi was trying to do of making a distinction between a satyagraha that is non-coercive. And I think, so this also to me means there's something important thinking to me about the past and future of satyagraha the important contrast might be for us, not between satyagraha and revolutionary violence. That's a traditional contrast we often see, but another kind of contrast that Gandhi was working on between satyagraha and other kinds of ostensibly nonviolent protests or liberal constitutional protests, or we might say street politics of a certain kind, which we know Indian politics is dominated in many ways by street politics. Um, that may look like Satyagraha, but may not in fact be Satyagraha. And Shaheen Bagh, I think, brought out what is some of the more distinctive features of Satyagraha. So if we take the example of Dharna, which, which Vinay brought up, which is very interesting, because yes, Gandhi uh, continuously would say Dharna is not a practice of Satyagraha, and we'll pick up the two aspects that Vinay mentioned. One is fasting. Very interestingly, Gandhi was really um, suspicious of fasting. He didn't follow his own rules. We know that the Pune Pact was a blackmail, but Gandhi consistently said fasting had a tendency to become moral blackmail. Blackmail in is a kind of coercive instrument and shouldn't be used by just anyone in any circumstances. The second though about Adarna is not just um, the coerciveness of a, a, a fast unto death, but you would, you would block someone physically. And I think it is interesting that Gandhi wrote very critically about whether it was a, during non-cooperation and students blocking entry into universities or in pickets, um, not just blocking people uh, from entering stores, but shouting at people. So all these things he thought, the level of physical direct intimidation should be kept to a minimum in Satyagraha. And I think this, isn't not, this was not just a moral maxim. It was, of course, Gandhi thought protest should be respectful of the autonomy and be non-coercive of your opponent. That's the nature of creating a democratic society. But he also thought it was ineffective. He thought if you were shouted at or intimidated, you're as likely to dig, dig deeper into your own position and you wouldn't be moved by the kind of sa sacrifice. And I think one element that Shaheen Bagh really demonstrated was something that King and Gandhi were very interested in, which was silence. So beyond the, um, the conviction that a continuous performance of sitting <laughs> in the same spot over a long time, the dignity, the commitment, I think Gandhi and King were very interested in silence as a way to disrupt your immediate uh, resistance to a protest you may not already be sympathetic to. So 
Gandhi was very interested in very large protests. He very, when, when a protest became large, he really was very suspicious of speeches, um, of speechifying. He would say that speech was a way to, um, to excite the crowd, um, but not necessarily draw people's attention to it. So silence was a way to draw people's attention to think about the meaning of a protest. Some of the other examples we've seen historically you know, in the Black Lives Matter protests, the hands up signal, ACT UP used to have these very specific non, you know, again, non-speech, but you just perform, you know, you have these outlines of a kind of a murder outline. You have these scenes, silent scenes, in which one can see the message of the movement immediately and not, um, not one that's mediated by speech, which I think Gandhi was very suspicious. He, he says in a quote that I was looking up, he says, you know, speech, too much speechifying shows that you're not confident. Uh, and in fact, the meaning of a protest should be done in the sacrifice, in the act itself. So I think there's something really important that Shaheen Bagh did in addition to the things that Vinay beautifully brought out, the kind of prefiguration of a new kind of society in its way, in its living together, um, the idea of decentralization. But I think as a form of protest, Shaheen Bagh also uh, reminded us that one of the features of Satyagraha, which also distinguishes it from your usual political protests, which a number of people come out, show placards, this happens everywhere. That's the distinctiveness is a kind of um, performance or theatricality in a good way of the meaning of the message. So the salt Satyagraha um, shows in an immediate act what the protest is about. It's symbol there's a kind of deep symbolic politics. I, as again, I think some of these other more recent protests in the US, Black Lives Matter show too. And in the anti-CAA protests, in addition to Shaheen Bagh, you also had that use of silence um, with the readings, the slow ritual readings of the constitution in these nightly vigil, vigils, candlelight vigils. So I think here uh, in King, the uh, um, another version would be when you had a large protest, you had songs. So again, not speechifying, but a slow march. I mean, King often said a good march lasts 60 days, you know, not just because you show commitment and uh, purpose and de demonstrate it, not just a single one day flash mob, but it's also that you walk slowly, you know, you draw people's attention in. And, the, and that idea was that the meaning, you know, the meaning of the message has to be embodied in protest. And I think that's one of the lessons of Satyagraha, that the means and ends of protests come together that um, sharply. Um, I think the last, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna end there, um, partially because I do want us to ask questions, to hear um, from some responses. And I think Vinay brought up so many other interesting questions. I'm gonna just end there. And basically, I guess my end point would just be to say that if we're thinking about the past and future of Satyagraha, one aspect of Gandhian thinking that I think hasn't gotten enough attention is the dis trying to distinguish satyagraha as a form of protest that's not just about getting a lot of number of people, not just a display of power, but a particular way in which you try to disrupt people's natural uh, reactions and draw them in and rethink their um, foundations. And I think he was a very, satyagraha has to be some, uh, uh, has to do something different than traditional politics, which polarizes, but is supposed to somehow change those coalitions in that act of protest. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you all three speakers. And now the question and answer session will start. Before that, we have a uh, announcement for the coming week. Coming week will be Ashok Vajpayee, the very famous Hindi poet critic, uh, who is a very well-known dissenter also, a cultured activist in India. Uh, remember, he was the first one who returned his, returned his um, um, I think, uh, uh, Sahitika Academy Award uh, to government in protest. Uh, and he, the concluding remark will be given by Professor Ganesh Devi. Uh, a very well-known linguist in India, and introductory remark by Dani Shabal. So over to you, uh, Rafat, um, for question and answer. And if you are in hurry or you're... Or no, what? that's fine. Okay, that's fine. That's good. 
Thank you. Take over, please. My family has left. I will join them later. Oh, wow. <laughs> thank you. So, thank you. Before we begin the question and answer session, I would like to thank all the professors, Professor Venelal, Professor Ramaswamy, and Professor Mantina. So, thank you very much, all the speakers. And let's begin the uh, question and answer session. Everyone knows, almost everyone knows how to raise a digital hand or show your interest in on the chat box. So I will be monitoring the um, question and answer session, uh, uh, monitoring the chat box as well as the digital hand. Okay, let's begin with uh, Satinath Chaudhary Saab. And uh, do you want to, Satna Saab, or I yeah. can ask your question? Go ahead. Read your question, please. No. Um, my question is basically what uh, two of them have written, and they are um, why did Gandhi call Dharna as Duragra? Uh, and the second question is doesn't uh, census? accomplish the purpose of NPR and why did uh, the Congress government or the NPA government in 2010 introduce this uh, NPA in 2010? Yeah. Thank That's you. Welcome. Uh, are we collecting a couple of questions together or, or do you want me to answer? The yeah, question? please go ahead and answer because they get mixed up and sometime not to addressed. So we request you to please go ahead one by one. Thank okay. you. So with regards to the first question, uh, because this question mm -hmm. coincides uh, to some degree with some of the uh, observations made by uh, Professor Mantena. Um, uh, and so I am going to take the occasion to also just uh, 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 reference some of what she said. Um, yeah. So the question is, uh, why did Gandhi call dharna a form of dura graha? Uh, and uh, the way to address this is to think about coercion. So this is, I think, the point that Karuna was talking about. Um, uh, my uh, reading of uh, Satyagraha may be a little different than hers in so far as I don't think that Gandhi ever actually conceded that Satyagraha is coercion. This is an interpretation that everyone else has said that it's almost impossible to think, so goes the argument that it is almost impossible to think of political action of this kind, which may not uh, uh, which wouldn't be coercion. That is that it may not be coercion uh, uh, in intent, but it will be experienced as coercion by the recipient of that action. But I, uh, and again, uh, you know, we may perhaps have a different reading, but I'm, I'm not aware that Gandhi himself actually really ever conceded that Satyagra is coercion. So uh, that's point number one. Number two is that that dharna is, uh, let me give an illustration of why dharna would be a form of duragraha. All right, uh, I cannot think of any better way to answer it than by giving this particular illustration. So we have texts which now very clearly establish, show, going back to the early medieval period, uh, and again, uh, even more recent times, where a person sits dharna, and then what happens is the person he's sitting dharna against also sits dharna. Now it ends up becoming a duel. It's like the, the duel. Okay. And what Gandhi submitted, of course, was that this has nothing to do with truth anymore. Because if the if Satyagra's uh, if what is behind Satyagra is the pursuit of truth, the pursuit of truth. What is happening here is simply actually I go and sit dharna, I go and sit outside your door because I'm trying to register the fact that I have a complaint. But then the other person says, let me sit dharna too. Let's see who outlasts the other. And this actually becomes uh, an instance of 
might becoming right. Right? In short, that's what it becomes. So, uh, 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 but, but the reason I bring it up because, and, and, and you notice my tentativeness that I wanted to make everyone aware that this is what Gandhi thought, but uh, I'm not necessarily clear in my mind that I go, would go along with him in thinking that in sitting dharna here, the women were committing a form of duragraha. And I think the broadest way in which I would like to address this question then is uh, to go to what Karuna had said, which I agree with entirely, that you see, I think that we can think about many movements which appear to uh, uh, have a real resemblance to a Satyagra movement. And in fact, I would say that one can think in recent years of what I would call a global architecture of st street dissent. Street dissent, street protests have become very prominent everywhere. And, and around the time that Shaheen Bagh was unfolding, we had the umbrella movement in Hong Kong. Um, uh, now, does that consider, uh, does that, uh, should one view that as a form of satyagraha? It's, it's not violent. It's not violent. Uh, and what it actually is really fascinating, I mean, I did a lecture on that uh, recently on the umbrella, on the movement there, is that the, there is a semiotics to it. Uh, how the umbrellas were used, they were not used as weapons of aggression at all, but nevertheless, they were used in various ways. Uh, and thinking of this together, um, my view is that one will have to uh, sort of articulate to some extent a new grammar of dissent, which would complement the kind of grammar of dissent that Gandhi had really come up with. That's That's so that goes to the question of how to think about dharna and what is its relationship, if any, to truth very briefly, okay? And the second question that was asked here was a question about, about um, uh, the NPR and, and uh, why this exercise was necessary. Uh, you know, we have to remember, uh, and I'm, I'm not offering any justification uh, of the NPR. I was just suggesting, number one, that the, NP, that the history of NPR is a history that does not begin with the, with the BJP, with the present Hindu nationalist government. It's important to mention this because not everything originated, not everything that we dislike originated with the Hindu nationalist government. Uh, there are great many things that originated the, the whole communalization of politics. We've had this going on, as we know, for decades. Uh, it has taken certain forms. It has become much uglier. Uh, it has been now outsourced to hooligans on the street. It has been outsourced to trolls on the internet. I mean, there are various strategies that they have adopted. The Hindu nationalist government, which uh, are extremely alarming, frankly. Uh, but uh, my invocation of NPR here was to suggest what the prehistory is, how we think about the relationship between the CAA um, and um, the NPR and, and the NRC, okay? Uh, but, the, but to speak most directly to the question, the, the stated view of the government has been that the census gives you the demographic data uh, uh, it, uh, uh, and the data, uh, it can be quite rich, um, but uh, that data, uh, it does not involve the kind of other data that the NPR, because the NPR, what it does is it actually entails uh, a study of certain neighborhoods, certain areas that are considered to be representative, and then actually looks at these households, looks at these households in somewhat greater detail than what a census would. Uh, I have not done a detailed study of uh, uh, the NPR and I'm not really aware of any, what I would call real scholarly literature that has been published on the NPR as such. Uh, the work that has been done has been done largely on Assam. And there the work that has been done has had to do with obviously the question of uh, illegal migrants, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the particular manner in which the tenor of uh, that society has been changed 
because of a huge influx of Bengalis, for example, and so on. Right? But that's thank you, thank, thank you, Professor Lal. There are so many questions lined up. Please be brief in your. Okay, next person is Rudranchi. I have just a follow up, uh, you know, small. No, no, thank no, you. No, no. Sri Pansa, no, no, there are no, so follow, many. no follow. If time permits, we will come back to you. Thank okay. you so much. There's thank not. You. So, my question is to Professor Vinilal, and that question would be that I got a feeling that once in your lecture you try to say that uh, all the women protesters weren't well aware of what the CAA was for. Is it necessary to be well informed to participate in any protest? Thank you. Well, I thought that I had very clearly stated that it is not. In fact, I emphatically made the, made the statement that there is absolutely no moral obligation on the part of people involved in the, in, in, in the movement to conform to someone else's idea of what a movement should be and whether they should be well informed. And in fact, I even gave the analogy uh, of the uh, immigrant rights uh, movement here in Los Angeles, where I said that Hey, people join the movement for all kinds of reasons. And in fact, just as people join revolutions for all kinds of movements. I mean, there's a huge studies that have been done of 1857, 1858 rebellion, which show very clearly that the vast number of people involved in the were not even were not even rebelling against the British. I mean, they were using the occasion to to uh, square debts with landlords, with money lenders. So no, I mean uh, I'm very clear on that. There's there's no uh, there's no uh, reason to suppose that that movement becomes diminished, the Shaheen Bagh movement, if not everyone was aware of it. And here I'm not only speaking about the women. I'm speaking about the tens of thousands who would come to Shaheen Bagh and and you know holding placards and doing this and that, and some of them just basically being spectators. But I'm quite clear about that. So I hope that that uh, answers the question. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lal. Uh, the mm -hmm. next, Thank uh, you, next question is from Shrikant Chopra Saab, and uh, he is a two part question. Do you agree that Article 14 and 15 don't apply to the immigrants defined in CA? So there's the first question. Second is, how do you think that Modi's right wing government? allowed these protests in China Bagh to continue for three months in spite of significant public backlash. So uh, yes. please be brief. Uh, yeah, no, I, yeah, no, I don't agree that Article 14 and 15 apply only to those who are uh, citizens. They apply to any person who's, who's in India. Uh, you, you, don't, you don't forfeit all your rights simply because you're a citizen. Uh, certainly not under modern uh, democratic regimes, whether they're liberal, semi-liberal or not, uh, you know, uh, I think that Article 14 and 15, I think, from my standpoint, are uh, unequivocally clear on this. And there are actually constituent assembly debates that speak to this uh, question. A uh, second question had to do with uh, 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 how did uh, wh why did the Modi government uh, allow this? Uh, was it framed in that way? Well, why did the Modi government allow this to take place for three months? Yes. So let me put it to you this way. I don't agree with the premises of the question. I don't think it's the Modi government allowing it. I don't think they were able to do anything about it. I think that was the strength of the movement. Now, of course, one can take a view that, look, uh, that somebody like Modi and the and the government, they're agile enough, enough in their thinking to say that, look, we'll allow a certain amount of dissent because we have to be able to, after all, convey to both um, fellow Indians and to the rest of the world uh, that we are a functioning democracy. You could take that view. Uh, in my view, whatever the merits of that view might be, and there are certainly instances where states will do that. The states will allow dissenters whom they might otherwise have complete disdain for, whom they would rather see eliminated in some fashion or the other removed from the public sphere, uh, they will permit them. Um, but I don't think that this is a consideration here. I think that everything shows very clearly that this movement had 
become a movement that the government was no longer able to actually contain. They, you know, I did not refer to the many mini Shaheen bugs, for example, that came up all over the country which also speaks to the question of decentralization. See, there, there are lots of, since I've been asked to be brief, I, 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 I'm just going to just quickly make the point. It's much more difficult to address um, a movement and to defang it, right? To do away with it uh, when a movement is very decentralized, number one. A movement that does not have discernible leaders is also much more difficult to deal with. These people also very well understood the, the fact that this theatricality of nonviolence, as it's sometimes called, the performativity of it, this has an audience. Uh, you can speak about the particular relationship between whether this kind of theatricality is in some ways the oxygen of any nonviolent movement, uh, but we can think of all of these considerations as being important, but I think what was of signal importance more than anything else was the fact that this movement was a movement that had originated with and then eventually garnered strong support from within many different communities. And let me, as a final comment, say that Literally, two hours after the lockdown went into effect on the 24th of March of 2020, the COVID-induced lockdown, literally two, three hours after this, all the murals, all the signs had been removed. They had been whitewashed. The place was completely cleared. They had not been able to do this for three months, the state. So I don't think it's a question of, I think they, if, one, if one poses a question saying, why did Modi permit this? I don't think it's a question of Modi permitting it to, it, it to happen. Thank, thank, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Professor. I, I, I can okay. give a very little clarification to Srikant Chopra ji that the Modi government had nothing to do with it. The matter was sub judice before the apex court. And it was the court for the court to order the forceful removal of the protesters or not. And the thank Supreme you. Court refused to do that. Okay, thank you, Rudranchu. So there are many more questions lined up. So Professor Lal or any other speakers who wants to address, be brief, please. So the next question is from Porras Dadabai. The power to women was short in suffrage uh, movement in the USA. Several videos showed that the women were being paid and were professional paid protester. Where, do, where did these funds come from in street politics? So, so sorry, I couldn't hear anything at all. Uh, I, I lost the connection for 15 seconds okay. or so. No, no problem, I'm, I'm gonna to repeat. So power to the women were showed in suffrage movement in the USA. Several videos showed that the women were being paid and were positioned. So he's talking about the movement of the suffrage movement in USA. And he asking a question, where did these funds come from to support the street uh, uh, protest? Where do the funds come from? Yes. Are, are well, they professionally I, I, paid protesters? Yeah, no, I, 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 I don't think that I would, I would uh, be inclined to think that uh, one should think of things like uh, where do the funds come from? Uh, I mean, clearly, obviously, you know, uh, if, uh, if uh, 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 tea is being served and, you know, they've got some uh, samosas being handed out, uh, I, I don't know that you need any huge uh, sponsors for this. I mean, there were people who brought in food, uh, but I, I think that, look, I mean, I'm going to be very bold about this, okay? Uh, I think that one should think about what the question, whether knowingly or unknowingly insinuates. Uh, and that has to do with this whole idea that these movements are frankly backed up by 
powers that be, people who you know are uh, uh, you know who have the uh, the means to influence the nature of the movement and all of that. I don't really think it was the case over here. I think we have to recognize the integrity of the movement, uh, and there is certainly no evidence to suggest that there is any kind of large funding uh, behind okay. this movement. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much, Professor Lal. Their next question is on the significance of Shaheen Bab. The question is from Fazal Khan, and he is asking, why didn't it enjoy the participation of larger audience from the majority community? Do you think it achieved its intended goal? Yes. I think that that's a very pertinent question. Uh, uh, the, the question uh, the, the question is, you know, to what extent can we say that the movement enjoyed the support uh, of uh, people from the majority community? Uh, do we have, uh, you know, evidence one way or the other? Uh, now, speaking to it very briefly, let me begin with the following statement. Uh, I think that the Hindu middle class today is very seriously communalized, very seriously communalized and compromised in this sense, okay? Um, that's not to say that the movement didn't have any support at all uh, from people in the majority community uh, and uh, um, let's say among Sikhs as well. Uh, I, I think it did have some support, but I think that, I think that uh, certainly in North India and places like Delhi, uh, I, think, I think that uh, Hindu middle-class families have become so deeply communalized. And I think that the damage that has been done uh, will take a generation. Uh, I don't, whatever the outcome might be of the next election, I, I think it's a foregone conclusion to my mind, but even let's say the election after that, whatever the electoral outcomes, I think that a generation has been lost in some sense. And that really is the answer to the question. Uh, that one shouldn't expect, unfortunately, uh, at least, as I said, in some parts of India, certainly in some parts of North India, uh, 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 the wind blows differently in some other parts of the country. So therefore, one would also have to look at these mini Shaheen Bags. Uh, there are many of them. And one would have to look at what was the nature of the support in each of these places. But my overall impression is that it would be incorrect to say that it had no support uh, among those in the majority community, uh, but I would certainly be uh, willing to concede that given the nature of the communalization uh, of Indian society and of the public sphere, that uh, one would not expect that much support. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, that's the general consensus. Yeah, a generation is lost. Thank you. So the next question is from Abdul Jabbar Saab. Uh, thank you, uh, fantastic uh, lecture. Uh, wish I was there at, uh, at UCLA still. I left uh, 33 years ago. Uh, so the, <laughs> the question here, uh, you kind of uh, talked about uh, Iran movement. Uh, I think kind of, uh, to me, at a spring, uh, uh, 2011, uh, was another movement, yeah. mass movement, uh, that did not have leaders. But if you look at the history of movements, mass movements, popular movements, like Gandhi, Mahatma, uh, the MLK here, is always, uh, there is there has to be a leader for the movement. Yeah. Uh, but I think it, in the case of uh, Shahid Bab, probably it was a successful. Also, I think uh, these kind of movements uh, might work with the leaders in democratic uh, societies, not in autocrat or dictatorship. Can you comment on uh, those points? Yes, Thank well, you. yeah, yeah, look, I mean, I, 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 there, there are two points. Um, and one has to do with uh, the very last thing. Let me speak to that first, uh, because I, I started my comments, my, my uh, lecture with that observation. Uh, because the, the second point you made was that this kind of movement is more likely to succeed in a democracy than, than a dictatorship. Uh, that look, I mean, at least Gandhi's view is, uh, was, uh, and I think he's, he's quite consistent in holding to that. Okay, his view was that we cannot think that Satyagra is more efficacious 
under some political systems than others. All right. Uh, the more lofty meta, the more lofty philosophical view from Gandhi is one shouldn't even think of efficaciousness. Actually, if 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 you're thinking of if you're thinking of the means, uh, if you use good means, they will result in a good end, so to speak, or at least one might hope so. But you have to be more attentive to the means, and you have to be at, than to the ends. So I don't know that Gandhi would ever have given it much thought. I mean, recall all the, the discussion that has taken place about his advice to the Jews uh, and uh, uh, during the whole period of um, uh, uh, anti-Semitism. Uh, well, that's not the right way to put it because anti-Semitism, of course, has a much longer history. But I'm thinking about the more modern, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, political anti-Semitism, particularly after the Nuremberg laws come into place in 19. Uh, 33 and and moving all the way of course to uh, the thank you uh, the end thank you yeah. so professor lal three more questions with short answers <laughs> and that will be the end so the next question is from muhammad zubair how did shaheen bagh movement influence the understanding and interpretation of secularism in india ah uh, yes uh, thank you muhammad Good to hear from you. Uh, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, how did it influence the uh, the view of uh, secularists um, and the interpretation of secularism in India? I, I think that's intellectually that's a very interesting question uh, because uh, and and in a way it's related to the question, of course, about whether the movement received support from the majority community. There's there one obvious ways in which one can link these two questions together. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that I have really seen, let's say, much reflection in the three years since uh, the movement was brought down uh, in the aftermath of uh, COVID, uh, in the aftermath of the declaration of the lockdown. Uh, I, I haven't seen much reflection on um, what might have been the ways in which it might have emboldened uh, the secularists might have made them think about uh, the, uh, whether secularism, as they have thought about it, uh, uh, still has a kind of a resonance. Uh, I think that the people who have been generally inclined towards secularism, towards, uh, I think that they certainly saw this movement uh, in a sec as a secular spirit, not as a spirit inspired by by religion, it may be Muslim women with whom it started, but then the movement belonged to everyone, so to speak. So it was not certainly inspired by, by uh, what we might call the idea of uh, religiosity or religious descent. Um, and even though it was initially uh, Muslim women who were involved in it before, as I said, many others move into the movement, students and um, other professionals and so on. And so I think if one takes that into consideration, I think that the movement can be viewed uh, within secularism. I would like to know what Karuna thinks of Arya because she is someone who has written extensively on the question of secularism um, and politically, particularly as a philosophical, you know, the philosophical vein uh, from the point of view of political philosophy. But that would be, I think, my my answer to that question. Professor Mantina, do you want to add something? Uh, no, I mean, I'm, I'm in agreement with Vinay. Uh, I think, I think uh, just to get the one point that I think he did make was that just, you know, what I think Shaheen Bagh and the many mini Shaheen Baghs, as well as the anti-CAA protests in other places, like the uh, reading of the constitution, I do think those were all trying to both they were trying to enact what would be the nature of a secular society. So I think in a way they were still um, innovating and thinking through what does it mean for different citizens of different faiths to come and live together. So I think it, in a way Shahin Bagh was a, um, a kind of experiential or practical demonstration of what this possibility that has yet to be fully established would look like. And I think the other point is partially what the Shaheen Bagh protest, as well as other Muslim protests in that period, showed was that the you know the minorities or Muslims see themselves rightfully as the vanguard of protecting 
and innovating a politics of secularism. So I think that also was very vivid and unusual because as we know, it's been hard for Muslims to be so at the, at the forefront of a movement in many years in India. So I think that was also what was so striking is the confidence by which these women in particular could, could take up that mantle. So. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Martina. The next question is from Sayyid Khalid Saab. This is a yes and no question. Are there concentration camps in East India for illegal immigrants? Yes or no question. Uh, Concentration camps. Concentration camps is uh, is an ugly phrase. Uh, well, I think I think that I think that uh, there are holding centers. Uh, uh, I think that that has been uh, that has been uh, documented. Uh, I don't know that I would call them concentration camps, uh, but there are certainly uh, de detention uh, slash holding centers. Uh, and you know what exactly they do, that's I think a long subject, yeah. Okay, thank you. The last question is from Shahi Siddiqui Saab. Where can Hindus find a homeland if not in India? That's a very <laughs> tricky yeah, question, yeah, go yeah. ahead. I think we have to think differently about home. What is it, what is it to think about a home? Um, where, what kind of home does one want? Uh, did, uh, you know, there is a let, 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 let me let me uh, begin to answer this very briefly by recounting a debate that took place, as it's described between Mohandas Gandhi and B. R. Ambedkar, where uh, B. R. Ambedkar tells Gandhi at the end of it, "Well, Atma Ji, you at least have a home. I don't have a home." Well, in a manner of speaking, he's right, and in a manner of speaking, he's wrong. And why, why do I say that? I say that because of course, uh, Gandhi was in some ways a homeless person. Uh, he never really had any conception of home in the ordinary sense of home. Uh, and, I, and, and there, uh, there are diff many different ways to read it, beginning with the fact that he never really lived as it were within the nuclear family cluster. Uh, he al always lived in ashrams, uh, okay, but then, India, in some ways, was not a home to him. And in, in 1947, the country had become, in some manner of speaking, in some manner of speaking, unrecognizable. The Congress party itself was not a home. Remember, he's not even a paid member of the Congress from 1925. Okay. Uh, so, you know, I, I can elaborate upon that. In so many different ways, one can think about someone who was oh. of Gandhi as someone who was benefit of a home. Uh, and who felt himself increasingly adrift in the very nation state that he had forged, helped to come into being. Uh, today, okay. ironically, Ambed, uh, you could say that Ambedkar and the Dalits uh, can cl lay claim to a home, so to speak, in a way in which Gandhi, I'm not sure would be able to anymore. Uh, yeah. particularly the kind of animus against Gandhi that is now becoming part of the common sense of Indian culture. I mean, just look at the assaults on him from virtually every side that you can think of. You know. Okay, that was the last question, but I see one more hand raised. Ranjana Paji, please go ahead. And that will be the last question. Ranjana, please. Thanks so much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. This is a brilliant session. Thanks so much. Um, I've been thinking for some time about uh, Satyagraha and I'm going to think about it also. I want to ask Vinilal that uh, what are the limitations of this comparison? Because, you know, we are a bit cautious also about the omniscience of the Gandhi aura and uh, especially his uh, mention of uh, his thinking of Ram Rajya, which is based on morality, virtue and all that yeah. lest it does not run into the risk of appropriation, but I'm going to think for myself also and we'll keep in touch with you. Yes. Yeah. Um, right. So, I mean, you know, you, look, uh, uh, what are the limitations there, uh, particularly when one thinks of Gandhi and one thinks of the invocation of Ram Raji and so on. 
you know, I look, uh, one way to answer that is to look at uh, uh, look at what is called the Ganga Jamana Tehzeeb. Okay? I mean, the, the culture that developed in the Duab in that region. Uh, I mean, you know, I refer to Sayyid Nakvi's play, The Muslim yeah. Vanishes. Uh, there are there are even Muslims who who uh, would use the name of Ram in everyday greetings. So to properly address that, I don't. I think it is taken to be prima facie to be a limitation of Gandhi. This is one of the critiques that he used Hindu symbols too much and so on. Uh, I I must say I'm not persuaded. I'm not persuaded by 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 that. I think that we'd have to think through that very rigorously. Uh, 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 clearly, the question of you know how the Muslims uh, uh, thought of him, uh, what was his relationship to Muslims over a very long period of time. I think all of this would have to enter into that particular equation. But more, but the other end of the register is as I said. So one is to look at Gandhi's own life, his own practices. Uh, how does he deploy a certain vocabulary? But the other end of it is to think about. Uh, the um, the the Indo-Islamic culture that developed, uh, which I think is uh, one of the most distinct and glorious contributions uh, uh, of India, you know, and within within that ambit, then I think the idea of Ram Rajya takes on a different meaning, frankly, you know. One Thank would you. also have to think about how one thinks of utopias. Thank you, Professor Lal. So, yeah. come, although the time is running out, I am coming back to Satinath Chaudhary Saab. He wanted to have some clarification. So, please go ahead, very brief. And uh, he is ask, he is asking your address, so you can contact to Dr. Razi Raziuddin, and he can provide that information. And that Satinath Saab, please be brief. And what clarification you need from your first question? Yeah. The, um... This uh, dharna you said is uh, coercive, whereas this uh, satyagra is not. Uh, what did he call uh, the fast? He went uh, unto death uh, on uh, in this uh, Puna pact thing. So, yeah, well, what, yeah, a satyagra I, or a dharna? Uh, uh, I mean, Karuna mentioned that as well. And, and here again, I mean, it, this is not because I'm a diehard, uh, you know, a Gandhian. I, I don't like the word Gandhian. And, and uh, l luckily, she never used it, uh, <laughs> uh, you know. But but even on even on the Pune Pact, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not so sure I would so, e so quickly come to the view that it was blackmail. Uh, we, uh, I, I think that, yeah, so I, it's going to be impossible to answer this question briefly because we're going to have to really look at what transpired, you know, what is this whole idea of separate electorates? What is the place of the Dalit within the Hindu imaginary? Uh, for example, is this whole question related to the question of temple entry? I think it is, for example, uh, because, you know, Ambedkar's view was grounded in something which has now become, I would say, the kind of the the, the Dalit view today, particularly of people like Kancha Ele and many others, that hey, you know, the Dalits and Hindus are completely distinct. They have nothing to do with each other. Uh, I to properly address this, one would have to address all these questions. And so there is no simple answer to it. Okay. Thank you, Professor Lal. That and so the question and answer session. And yes. once again, I wanted to thank uh, uh, Professor Lal, Professor Ramaswamy, and Professor Mantina. It was a great discussion. And uh, I'm going to leave. You guys can continue if you wish. Razibai, back to you. No, I think, um, thank you very much, uh, Rafat. I think we had enough of, you know, two hours passed. I think a lot of audience, among the audience would be tired by now, uh, especially um, Ramaswamy, Professor Ramaswamy is in Delhi area quite late now. Um, remember, he was complaining while coming at 8.30. So, uh, <laughs> this is quite late. <laughs> quite late and um, not good enough for discussion. I think people have asked a genuine question. 
and the responses were very good. Um, just uh, my curiosity, and um, I'm not going to take uh, much time. Uh, what was, what you think, or any of you three, what was the real intent behind this, uh, forcing this, uh, even though it got it started from, uh, by Congress government, but the pushing really came uh, from BJP, you know, just like FCRA. FCRA was introduced by Congress, but the, really the ex exploitation and abuse of FCRA was clearly by BJP. So what was the real intent? You see, you think it is just simply to polarize? The real intent in pushing forward this legislation? Yes. Yeah. To test, to test the minorities or the secularists or to polarize. Both are two or maybe two in one. Well, you know, look, uh, this is not the answer that anybody wants to hear, probably. But to my mind, there is no question that, that to some degree, the state um, intended to do exactly what the legislation states. Okay? That is that they say, hey, look, there are Hindus who are being, Hindus and others non- non-Muslim minorities, um, uh, Buddhists, Sikhs, Jains, etc. Uh, and remember, by the way, Buddhists, Sikhs, Jains, all of them, you know, there's still, there's still a view in some parts that these are all sects of Buddhism, to use a, a Christian kind of word, but that they're, they're all offshoots of Hinduism. So it's fundamentally one religion. Uh, it, it, let's not address that question, but there, is, there are some who persist in holding to that view. A constitution of India itself is, by the way, ambiguous on that in some ways. But uh, uh, in brief, uh, the view was that, yes, these people are, in fact, actually being persecuted. I mean, as I said, there is there's certainly plenty of data on, on uh, particularly Afghanistan, uh, the fact that these other religious communities have virtually disappeared, virtually disappeared. I mean, you just talk about a handful of people left there. Um, in, in Pakistan, the numbers have remained steady, but it's steady at a low percentage. What is, because it's about 1.3%, 1.3, 1.4% is where it's remained steady. So, so, that. so, they so, I, to, think, yeah, so I think that the, in the first instance, in the first instance, it was that. However, given the nature of this nature of this government, there's a lot more going on, which is that it is certainly one way to mobilize. So, did the, they also the did they also get back a res seeing the response of Shaheen Bagh or related other mini Shaheen? Did they get a sort of uh, answer to it that it is not simply that much or not going to be possible. I mean, did they get a feeling that the minorities or secularists are not going to take it? Yes, well, I mean, I, I think that, uh, I, I think uh, what transpired, I think took them by surprise. I, I don't think they, I don't think the, the, the state was prepared for this level of response. Was it quite shocking? Like they got, they felt weakened by it or intimidated by it? Well, you see, I, I think that one has to look at the nature of this particular government. Okay. Uh, and, and I would say that, uh, no, I don't, I don't know that they were intimidated by it. I'm not sure what exactly intimidates them. Well, uh, the Karnataka result certainly does right well, now. Well, well they, uh, the, the, the fact that they have suffered an electoral defeat now. Remember, they suffered an electoral defeat in Bengal. And that, that is, that is a good calculation. Before this, and that was also described as a huge setback to them at that time. I don't see that they, ch they changed their behavior fundamentally. Uh, they control 95% of the electoral funds. 
in India, the BJP controls 95% of the electoral funds that go into elections. And I, I, so I think if you're, if you're looking, if one is speaking in that language, they're, they're there to stay from their standpoint. But they're, uh, they're constantly losing. Quality, but they're know. constantly losing one after another. Why but they're yes. constantly losing? Right, but you see, then uh, the, you know. Look, I mean, the, 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 this question has been in play for many years now. For the last five, six years, we know that they they, they don't control the majority of the state legislative assemblies. The BJP doesn't control the majority of them, but that when it comes to the time of the national election, uh, and, and some, and you know, you you'll have to speak to like Yogendra Yadav, who spent all their life studying this type of thing. I mean, I don't really, uh, you know, but you'd have to speak to someone like him. But uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the there is some people have argued that there is a, you know, the patterns for the state legislative assembly. Suggest one thing that, but then when it comes to the national election, it suggests something else. So, and uh, those are the kinds of questions that I think, uh, so, to some extent, one requires some understanding of uh, what one might call the psychology of the BJP and the Hindutva movement as a whole. But then there are some questions which require a more particular knowledge of uh, uh, politics on the ground in India. But I don't know. Maybe Karuna and Shankar have. Uh, I have some thoughts. Keep, keep in mind, keep in mind, change, change political landscape of Bihar, Maharashtra, and Bengal, and or now Karnataka. Keeping yes. in mind, do you think any of you can respond? Do you think that uh, BJP feels confidence about going ahead with the same Hindutva card? Can I answer that? No, not to you, all the speakers, not to you. Or no, if you don't want to say anything, leave it. Yeah, I think the others can speak now. I've spoken enough. You know. Yeah, thank you. Or I want to share something. Uh, I, I yeah. just want to, just because I'm taking advantage of this extra time. So uh, yeah. they have the, I'm still thinking and I'm going to go on thinking about uh, the comparison with Satyagraha. It is very important to understand the forms of protest especially when we are going through such a dark period. And um, uh, and it is so redeeming to look into history also, but where women have been protesting in the last few years itself, if you look at it, I'm speaking to everyone. I don't want to burden Vidilal only with it. I think he has been speaking since a long time. Uh, the women in the farmers movement, they had shown expression of sustained protest and in different ways and how their households were run, how the babies were taken care of everything we were getting to know through the excellent reporting when the media had stopped reporting on them. More recent is the success of the Anganwadi women workers also, and Shahin Bagh, of course, uh, which we discussed just now. So I was, um, uh, this is something that engages me because I'm from the women's movement. And I feel that um, if we look at it, uh, what would be most redeeming to um, be able to compare it with uh, uh, Satyagrad? I'm not resisting the idea at all, yeah. uh, particularly because I'm from Orissa and um, here land grab is happening in such a big way and there is uh, a bit of uh, opportunism and uh, in leadership also. And sometimes there are movements in which there are no leaders only of the little landless women trying to challenge the, a Jindal company or a Vedanta company in some part of Orissa. With or without leaders also, they are using the form of dharna. So yeah. perhaps I have, as an Indian have internalized this form of protest. Um, it's like osmosis, but uh, with the, and I think the best point that he, he has made is about uh, protesters not having to be informed because they are so organized, so disciplined. And sometimes there's no leader, sometimes there is no media to play up to, and yet they're having silent protests whenever the comments are being taken away. That's it, I'm not asking any questions. I just wanted to reflect. Well, I, I mean, I, I just want to offer two quick observations. One, one, um, uh, Ranjana, on what you've said, and one going back to a comment that Karuna had made. Uh, the first observation, I'll be very brief on that, which is that, uh, yes, I think that, uh, you know, if you look at the farmers' movement, uh, there also you see 
and involvement of women. Of course, the farmers' movement comes after Shaheen Bagh. So one of the one of the ways to think about the singularity of Shaheen Bagh is that you know the women's involvement on that scale in politics and political movements usually stemmed from what in shorthand are called women's issues, okay? Uh, or mm -hmm. issues having to do with the uh, violence against women. So for example, think of the Nirbhay uh, case uh, that generated large demonstrations um, in um, uh, Delhi and elsewhere. Uh, in fact, unfortunately the incident uh, 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 took place it's unfortunate. It took place uh, literally two blocks from uh, where my home is in Delhi, and so some of the first um, uh, demonstrations were there. Okay, but it, but this, but but they have been you know, the you know like the think about the Manipur women. So uh, they've been they've been various mm -hmm. other instances, but they all involved uh, issues where it had to do with women's safety, sexual assault against women, protests about that. Shaheen Bagh is of a different tenor in that sense. Uh, okay. And this relates to something that Karuna said, which I did not mention in my talk, although I'm well aware of that, that I think it's actually of singular importance. That question has to do with Muslim political participation yeah. in India and its history. So oh, yes, yes. what happens in that history, you have to go back to 1857-58, and many of Gandhi's interventions later on have to do with his sense that Muslims have to be drawn into the political and public life of India because they have been marginalized, particularly after the 57-58 rebellion, uh, when, when uh, vengeance was disproportionately meted out against the Muslims. And one of the things that happened to the community is it became insular. Uh, if you look at Peter Hardy's book on uh, the Muslims of British India, he shows you through concrete data, if you look at the 1880s, 1890s, Muslims had fallen far behind the Hindus in access to education at all levels, at all levels, far behind. I mean, the, the gap is astonishing. And so when you look at the Sanchar Committee report about a decade yeah. ago, the history of this goes back to that, you see. So what so this is movement is also important because it's another chapter in the history of Muslim political participation in the public life of the country. You see, and I think that that, that is very important. Yeah. Um, yes. That, yes. Certainly. On that, yeah. On that now. On that note, let's let's stop the meeting here session here. Is that it has been quite a lot and thank you again thank you all three speakers and the audience and hopefully we meet again thank you <laughs> all right thank, thank you. you thank you thank you